Dr. McCall, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we wanted to talk about the recently published study in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, which explores the scope of practice and training of physician assistants in ophthalmology. Could you first walk us through the purpose of the study? Like what led to the actual idea for the study? Absolutely. So a practitioner, um, Dr. Srikumaran at the Wilmer Eye Institute at John Hopkins University um, reached out to us and they were really interested in understanding more about PAs who are in ophthalmology as well as what their scope of practice is and their um, things such as their current subjective skills and abilities as well as uh, opportunities for growth and more education in ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and could you talk us a little bit, tell us more about the actual survey, what types of questions were asked and who it was sent to and, and you know, a high level view of that. So this was part of an existing survey that AAPA conducts on a quarterly basis called our PA practice survey. And in particular, we were interested in a follow-up survey for PAs who were practicing in ophthalmology. So we reached out to them. We found that over the past 30 years or so, the number of PAs in ophthalmology has not grown a lot and there were around 94 practicing PAs in ophthalmology in our AAPA database. So we reached out to those PAs as part of this survey and asked them to provide us with information related to their scope of practice, as well as things that they're doing in their practice separate from ophthalmology, but also what their desired skills and abilities are. So we reached out to them via email and we asked them to complete the survey. And since there is such a small number of PAs in the United States, and we were interested in capturing responses from as many of those as possible. PAs in ophthalmology who didn't respond, we followed up to, uh, with them via phone as well as US mail to ask them this series of 53 questions. And a lot of what our study is focusing on is exactly what are those PAs doing in their practice related to vision and ocular care, both their clinical tasks as well as things such as surgical and procedural tasks and then a variety of questions related to how they would rate their current skills and abilities versus their desired skills and abilities related to vision and ocular care. We also did some follow-up on their interest in postgraduate training programs that we think would be a perfect opportunity for PAs in ophthalmology to get additional training in this area, and they may have an opportunity to partner with ophthalmologists even more. So this study really started out because a practice had incorporated a PA into their practice, and we were interested at the national level, what are PAs working in this specialty um, experiencing, and what does their typical day look like? What does their scope of practice look like, and are there opportunities for growth there? Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it sounds great. So interesting. So how many, about how many uh, PAs are there actually at present? Yes, there are over 140,000 PAs in the United States as of December 31st of 2019. So we update that number every year. Okay. And so going back to the actual survey or study, what, so among the, there are, apparently there were eight skills and abilities uh, which, upon which respondents rated themselves. Uh, could you kind of talk us through that? What areas were rated more highly or, more, or lower on that scale of abilities and skills? that they identified? So we were really interested in eight specific areas, such as identifying patients with key risk factors for vision and ocular disease, um, identifying signs of vision and ocular health emergencies, uh, discussing potential risks and benefits of interventions for common vision and ocular disease, as well as checking pupils, extraocular movements, and confrontation visual fields. And then the other four skills and abilities that we were interested in PAs rating themselves on were checking visual acuity, slit lamp examination, um, fundus examination with direct ophthalmoscope, as well as removing foreign bodies from their ocular surface. And we had PAs rate their current skills and abilities on a scale of one to five, one being no skills and abilities and five being high skills and abilities. And we found that in five of these eight different areas, 
current versus desired skills and abilities significantly differed from one another. So PAs who were working in ophthalmology were showing moderate to high levels of skills and abilities based on their self-report in these areas, but their desired skills and abilities were even higher than that. And in the three areas where there were not significant differences, it was because the current skills and abilities were already so high that it was hard to detect a difference between the current and desired skills and abilities. Mm -hmm. And what skills did the respondents indicate that, would, that they felt would be most helpful to them to obtain, you know, to learn from postgraduate training, a formal program? In terms of if you're asking about where we saw the largest differences, in particular, um, there were large effect size related to the fundus examination with the direct ophthalmoscope, as well as removing foreign bodies from the ocular surface. Um, those were two of our larger effects, as well as uh, using a slit lamp examination. Okay. And while PAs are involved with procedures and surgery, they largely do not perform the procedures independently. And when they do perform procedures, what is their scope generally limited to? Yes. So what's unique about PAs in the United States is often they are working with a collaborating physician. So in some states, their scope of practice is determined at the practice level. In other states, it's uh, written into law or other forms of regulations precisely what they can do. So in a small sample like this of PAs in ophthalmology, it's really difficult to, for us to determine precisely how these things might differ by state law and regulation. So that's something that we're really interested in, not only um, for a study like this on PAs in ophthalmology, but just more generally, since laws do differ between states and whether or not that's determined at the practice level by the skills and abilities and desires of the collaborating physician, or if it's something that uh, PAs are not able to perform. Okay. And turning now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the actual shift that is being seen away from primary care into specialty care and specifically the surgical specialties. And, and although the number of physician assistants in surgical surgeries has risen, there has not been a concurrent rise in PAs in ophthalmology. And like, what are some reasons for that? So it's really interesting um, to, to consider this and why there might not have been a rise in PAs in ophthalmology. Some of this might involve training and exposure at the PA school level. So in the past couple of years, as of the time that we were writing this article, for example, there's not dedicated um, training specific to vision and ocular care once they're leaving PA school because in what's different about the PA profession from many other medical professions is that PAs are trained as medical generalists, so they receive lots of education on different areas, different specialties, and it's something that PAs don't enter PA school typically saying, I'm going to be a PA in ophthalmology with the exception of, say, those PAs who have had previous vision and ocular experience. So a big part of it may be related to training, and that's another reason why there may be an opportunity for post graduate clinical training in ophthalmology that may increase interest in uh, PAs moving into an ophthalmology setting. Mm -hmm. and, and in the survey also with the majority of PAs, you know, indicating it that moderate or extremely, the training would have been moderately or extremely helpful for them, how might the development of a formal postgraduate, you know, training program help to expand the pool of PAs who are qualified uh, for ophthalmology. Absolutely. So that additional training and experience that they're going to get um, in that area, with PAs being able to change their setting and specialty easily without additional formal education, providing those additional clinical experiences and clinical training potentially opens the door for more PAs to move into that specialty and be in partnership with collaborating physicians. And, and a little bit further, can we dive deeper into, you know, how might the integration of PAs help to accommodate workforce gaps, whether predicted or unpredicted? Absolutely. So there is not only a primary care shortage in the United States, but there are shortages for many specialties and settings. And being able to rely on PAs as well as NPs, other 
advanced practice providers is going to be one way that those shortages can be addressed so that the needs of ophthalmology patients across the United States can be met. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, do you want to anticipate any further study or, or a next step in this whole survey? So we are currently working on a follow-up study. This study focused on PAs in the United States that are currently practicing in ophthalmology. And an additional part of this survey focused on vision and ocular training among PAs who are not currently working in ophthalmology and understanding what their current and desired skills and abilities are on this range of the procedures as well as range of different knowledge areas. And we're hoping to understand how PAs who are not providing any care in vision and ocular health differ from PAs who are providing some of these vision and ocular procedures as well as um, services and how those differ between the two of them uh, versus the PAs who are already practicing in ophthalmology. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dr. Timakal. We really appreciate it. We look forward to hearing more about this. Thank you.